first speaker is uh, Omar Karim. So Omar is a creative director and AI image maker known for his innovative approach to creative storytelling. With over 13 years of experience working on campaigns with top fashion and lifestyle brands, including Nike, Burberry, uh, Prada, um, and Beats by Dre, he has earned a reputation for pushing boundaries and challenging the status quo. More recently, um, Omar has been at the forefront of the rapidly evolving field of AI for creativity. Uh, during his time at Meta, he, be he began exploring the potential of artificial intelligence to enhance the creative process and has, been, uh, has since become a leading voice in this emerging space. Uh, drawing on his deep understanding of design, art and technology, Omar has developed a unique approach to image making that blends traditional techniques with cutting edge AI tools. His work reflects a passion for experiment uh, experimentation and a commitment to pushing the boundaries of what is possible in the realm of visual uh, storytelling. So I will hand over to Omar. Amazing. And now, da, 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 da. okay. And now the one thing is, this is where the, um, the weirdness of this uh, screen setup. Mm -hmm. So if I, the only problem is, is that you, if I put it here, you won't be able to see. Okay. Um, I think there's a button in settings so you can mirror your s displays, maybe. Yeah. Okay, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where is it? <laughs> Let <it> lower. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it there? Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. So. And then. I think like if it's. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> oh, sorry. You're doing that. You're doing that awkward. That thing when you know, like. How oh, you yeah, do yeah. Well, yeah. oh, you know what? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. You can't see it, right? So. Um, no, they just get one? to see my weird ass uh, uh, desktop. It's fine. Can you see that? Amazing. Is, it? Is that on the screen? Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. How's it going? Um, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm going to see if I can uh, put this on full screen, which. <laughs> Hmm. Right, I'm going to do it that way around because I can't seem to like put it in presenter mode. Amazing. Hi everyone. Uh, this is my talk. It's uh, got a really long name because I just was trying to like make it sound really cool, but it didn't sound very good. So um, what I'm going to talk about is this idea that AI is a new creative frontier, and um, <clears throat> you know I think it's a glimpse into the future. Uh, I seem like there, there might be some videos that I won't be able to play, but I'll we'll cross that bridge because I didn't realise. Um, that I'm only going to talk for half an hour and then you get to ask questions. So I put loads of stuff in. So I'm going to go really quickly. So I'm Omar, so nice to meet you. Um, my background uh, is all the way from, like, I started off, like, making pirate radio stuff uh, that somehow uh, led into digital magazines, which got me a job in advertising. And while I was there, I worked on really, really fun brands at some really, really fun agencies and was always sort of, like, trying to understand, like, uh, how technology works in the sort of digital space for like communication work. So all the stuff I was doing was always like it goes somewhere and someone pays me money for it. So that's what was advertising. It was super, super fun because it was like um, a really interesting space to sort of like understand like where creativity fits into the broader scheme of the world. Uh, that led me to sort of like go, wow, making ideas in advertising takes a really, really long time uh, and it can take like months and months and then your work can die. Uh, that doesn't seem to happen or wasn't happening in the way that um, technology companies were running. So they would literally um, have this thing called minimal viable product and you just make the smallest thing and see if it works and you learn from it. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, you just get rid of it. 
I was like, oh, I wonder if you can do that with creative stuff. So I made things like um, a bot, a Twitter bot that was called How Many Drakes, and it turned Drake into a unit of measurement. And you could basically go, how tall is Mount Everest? And it'd be like 5,000 Drakes, and it would just work it out, uh, which is really good. And, you know, it got lots of, like, this website called uh, World, World Star Hip Hop wrote about it. So I thought, wouldn't it, be make, wouldn't it be amazing to sort of, like, capitalize on that? And I made an app that would measure how many Drakes you walked in a day. He then tried to sue me, and I had to stop. But that really made me sort of like go, oh my god, like this is definitely the right way. If like if Drake is trying to sue me, it's definitely I'm definitely on the right path, right? So um, <laughs> that's all that led me into like working in like big, big tech and like working at, at Facebook, uh, which then became Meta. And while I was there, like I was looking up. My job was to look after like luxury fashion and like the advertising they do on the platform. So you know, how can we sell more trench coats and blah blah blah? But at the same time. I'd never understood that, like, it's this massive organization and all of the people who are there are trying to do some really, really outlandish stuff, like people trying to work out, can you make people see again? Can you use AI to do all manner of, like, futuristic stuff? So they were only, like, a phone call away from me. So I started, like, chatting to lots of interesting people and then made a whole bunch of really interesting projects there, like virtual influencers, and I'll tell you about them in a minute. But... That then led into last year, which I'm going to talk about today, but some really fun brands to work with. And it was really interesting because it's literally using AI as part of the image making process, but also how it sort of like works far beyond just sort of like making an image or making a, a film. And, you know, I'm sure you guys already know all this stuff, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, and then, yeah, that, and now I'm here and I'd love to sort of like, you know, 2024 has already started off in this really interesting way of like, trying to understand like all the stuff that I learned last year. Like, is there any stuff I could share with anybody else that will make sense to them and go, okay, God, I need to pick this stuff up and what would I want to say? Okay, so anyway, what is AI? It's a, a software that sort of like works, you know, tries to replicate the human, human brain, um, which is why it would never gonna be as smart as us because it's not a good copy of the human brain. What is really interesting for creatives is, or for me anyway, is my background, like I said, I used to work in advertising. I was a copywriter, so my job was to write words. So when I saw a machine that could write words way faster, way better, and with way better spelling than me, I was like, my job is over, so I need to work out what to do. Um, and where we are now, like, you know, AI is like multimodal, so you can like show it a picture and ask it to write a poem. You can, you know, ask it to make a video from a, from a picture or make a picture from a video, whatever. Like, it's so interesting, like all the, mad amounts of things it can do um, and if we have enough time I'm going to talk to you about AI agents uh, I have my own AI called Alan um, Alan does so much of my work for me he's um, I was talking about Alan earlier and I was saying like Alan my own AI has basically afforded me to like I have naps in the middle of the day it's the best thing ever I love napping so it's amazing and you know what that's doing to like you know 3D objects and gaming and music right so I think music is going to be like the most interesting thing because it's the, you know, apart from fashion, it's the closest connector between, between anything and, t and culture. So like if AI music works in, in culture, then it's gonna work for any sort of commercial application and, and everything in between, right? But that's where it actually gets sticky. Anyway, I was trying to think of like a really good way of like telling you like what my sort of like main mission was. Like last year I was like, okay, I'm gonna be as curious as I can, just like, just do as much work as I want to do and like just see, see where it takes me, right? And I was gonna just say the word curious, but I was like, nah, this sounds way cooler. So embracing emerging skills is like the thing that I was like, okay, just anything new that happens, I like, just gotta pick up and do it, right? And you know, I, I say that with the, you know, I can't code or anything, so I don't really understand like how any of this stuff works. So if someone said like, what about this thing? And I'd be like, I don't know. But it's really interesting to sort of like hold this philosophy in your head, like just be curious with all this stuff. So. In this next bit, which I don't know how much time I've got, I'm gonna to talk to you about the projects that I did last year. And all of these projects are real life projects that happen in, in, in the sort of like, in the, in the real world. So these are beyond theory and sort of like start approaching like why like business, business is bottom line and how that sort of like impacts stuff. And it's been really interesting to sort of like go, people normally pay me to like come up with ideas. So what's my job gonna look like in the future when I can use these machines to do so many amazing things, so, and hopefully, like, I'm not just, like, going to talk you through my work and go, like, here's something else, something else I did. It's more like going, 
this is the this is the approach that we took with this project to see what would actually what is possible and how that works in the luxury space where you're not just making images just to sell stuff you're selling a very distinct kind of like lifestyle feeling anyway start off with Aries in Malibu Aries is a really amazing luxury uh, streetwear brand uh, based in Hackney Malibu is a really awful rum based drink uh, but they collaborated on this like really amazing project uh, where they were trying to sort of like um, capture the sort of like nostalgia of like be beach parties in the 90s and you know the sort of like what that sort of like vibe was back then so it was really interesting like you know we start talking about like trying to capture nostalgia in a time or place that doesn't exist right so what are we doing are we like you know how do we sort of like try to make how do we try to sort of like start off making those images authentic that was a really interesting interesting problem to solve like you know how do you make images and and why do they feel right and what is the sort of like reality of those images that is for a brand that is super super heavily focused on its images so we sort of started take, we started with this idea of like imagine if you could go back in time to this imaginary beach which ended up kind of being like near Miami somewhere but we took this theoretical camera right so we like imagine that we were going to go back in time and we we're going to take pictures of people in one day so everything from a guy hanging outside a petrol station a guy in a studio with his hat on and you know every single moment in between we sort of try to sort of understand like you know actually can we use an ai to create images but also create the story of making those images as well so that was really interesting but then we then took it another step further to go like okay what happens when you've got the sensibilities and the creativity of an actual fashion photographer so these images ended up being created they started off being created by me then they were like worked on and taken in a different direction by a fashion photographer called Dougie Irvine and then finally they were like retouched at the end so you've got this like three layered process of creating AI based imagery that isn't just I wrote a prompt and then a thing came out and then I showed someone it so super super fun but trying to capture lifestyle was a really really interesting a really interesting challenge um, and then how do we capture product, right? So they did this collaboration on a pair of grills and that sort of like idea of like, you know, how do we sort of like, one, how do we put grills into the image? Um, how do we make them feel natural? And how do they sit in an image that like, you know, amplifies the intent of the original product, right? Like it's, it's a pair of grills with a logo on it and a really nice A. They only made a few of them. They sent them out to influencers and stuff. So really sort of like trying to capture that sort of like energy of, of what they were making with these you know, handmade grills with these images that would basically be impossible, right? So we ended up like making these very sort of like, what, what would teeth look like if they were from the future? So it was basically like taking the concept of like the grills and taking them as far as you can. So obviously I think you might die if you turned your teeth into any of these things, but it was, you know, it was really fun to sort of like make them happen in, you know, we couldn't pay a model to like allow us to do that unless you went to Turkey or something. Anyway, um, that then sort of like extends out into like going, well, can we make, can we use AI to also explore the sort of like design language of it as well? And that then allowed, you know, this exploration wasn't the final sort of art direction that we went with, but it was a really interesting experience to go, what does that space look like? And, and how do we sort of combine it in a way to tell a brand story? Um, this is um, this was a project for a company called ASICS. They make trainers. Um, they are a sports company. But what they what their sort of like main belief is like the mental the the mental wellness of doing sports. Like what is the impact on your mental health of doing sports rather than here is another athlete. Like Nike is very much focused on like everyone's an athlete, but ASICS is focused on like everyone can feel good if they just did some sports. So we come onto this project called Train AI. Um, like when, when, when we talked about this project, this project basically happened at the, like the start of last year. And at that time, when you typed in person doing exercise into something like Mid Journey or many, many other tools, you would get someone with an impossible body. So they would just have, you know, multiple muscles that didn't exist. They'd be in, like, you know, like imp impossible bodies already exist because of Photoshop. But this is basically, you know, it stands at like it could just industrialize how how bad people will feel about themselves so we thought i wonder if we could like you know if we could make that different so we took we, we basically worked on a system sort of like take existing images from asics and use them to inject into mid journey at that time to allow us to like make more natural looking people or people whose body wasn't the reflection of their exercise so it was a really really fun exercise to sort of like go 
you know, we need to like point at like AI can make it's going to make people feel really bad about themselves if we just keep letting it do what it does. And thankfully now, after that time, in the newest version of Mid Journey, you type in a person doing exercise, you're more likely to get the after image than you are to get the before image. So that's cool. Not saying they're responsible for that at all, but just you know, um, I want to share this like the the two guys the before and after image. It was really interesting to sort of like just work on the asymmetry of the after image because. In the first image, the body's basically completely symmetrical. So to try to sort of like make it understand is the same as like trying to teach a machine to, to make spelling mistakes. So it's a very fun task to sort of like get that, get that movement inside the muscle. So super interesting to explore. Um, this is probably a really sort of like uh, applicable thing for you guys, which was this sort of like came out of this idea of like if you have, if an AI is a collection of concepts like locked away in, it, in its brain, then its strength is to sort of like look between those concepts, right? So well, what I mean is like, you know, you can say, show me a picture of a car, but make it out of jelly and it will show you a jelly car. So, oh, oh, amazing. I wonder if it can do the same thing if I go, tell me what you think the future might be or a potential of someone's like work, right? So did this project with Show Studio, um, this sort of like ran like most of last year, but we were like predicting a lot of the like, a lot of the fashion shows that were coming for this year. So it's been a really interesting process and it was really fun to sort of do to see just how right or wrong we were like a year later. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, the first one was J.W. Anderson, right? So <clears throat> it was really interesting because J.W. Anderson's like work, the, the sort of like primary sort of thing that we were getting back from research, which we sent out some AI agents to research him. I did anyway, because I don't know anything about him. Um, was very much that like his stuff is really playful, like play kept on being like the word that surrounded his work. So we took this idea of like going, well, why don't we start predicting his fashion, but start at play? So we start predicting toys. You know, what does a toy designed by J.W. Anderson look like? And then can we extrapolate fashion from the back of that? So that's why I think you've got a hat in the middle of those images that obviously looks like it's made out of leather and a cardboard box, but really sort of like, I. I Eventually, I don't think this like turned out to be too close to the truth, but there was a real sort of like way of sort of investigating fashion forecasting through through play and trying to use AI to do it in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. So this is definitely the one that like totally worked, right? So this was uh, when Pharrell went to Louis Vuitton. Right, what's he going to do? Took th this was really interesting because he took like a, a, a mass amount of his like lyrics and all of the stuff that was being written about what he might do or what, what this means for a really big fashion house, and then went, what happens? And I'm only showing you like select bits of it because there was a lot of bits for that it did get wrong, but it had this whole theme about like the West, like, you know, like cowboy stuff. And then when I saw it the other day, I was like, amazing, you should have totally gone to the betting shop. But, you know, it was really interesting to sort of like go like inside the machine, this validates the thought that like, there must be a way for us to sort of like start picking through stuff. So when we were picking through stuff for memories for Aries, and now we're picking through, not memories, but like predictively, not what will happen, what may happen. So it wasn't like definitely he's going to do that because, like I said, there's loads of pictures that I have that he did <laughs> that's got nothing to do with what he ended up doing. So it's a really interesting thing to sort of like sort of like shine a shine a torch in that direction. Um, and then another really interesting piece was uh, predicting Mugler. So this is really interesting because this was done without any training data, any extra training data given to an AI. So we didn't say this is who Mugler is, so you need to understand what Mugler does and this is how his cuts work, et cetera, et cetera. So it was an interesting, un like, an interesting way to sort of like go, this is what this concept looks like in the mind of a machine. So you know, it got it really, really right. Like, you know, the lace, the sheer cuts, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really, really fun to do this project. One, to sort of like think, what is it going to look like? But the really interesting bit was the only place it was starting to have good results was if we said, or if I said, I keep talking about if we said, I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. But it's really sort of like going, what does the runway look like? So what's the context of where this fashion was going to be seen? So when we were like, you know, we tried this whole thing of, um, you know, what does, li what does this fashion look like as a lifestyle image? And it just kept on like going off in this direction of motorbiking stuff. And I don't know why I did that. So we ended up like figuring out that actually, if you said, show me what it looks like on the catwalk, it produced interesting results. So Nike Various, uh, reason why I really wanted to sort of like share this was what, like my whole life, um, 
when I was a kid, I really, I, I love Wade Knight when I eventually sort of like, uh, I always wanted to work for them. And then when I got to advertising and the first time I got to work on some Nike stuff, it was the best day of my life. I could not believe someone's like, I'm going to put some Nike work on my portfolio. This is amazing. So this was like uh, November, December 2022. Um, the World Cup was going on and uh, France was in the world. I'm so sorry, I don't know much about football. They were about to like, it's basically like <laughs> France versus someone else, right? And if France won, this film would have like, we would have shown this film and unfortunately they didn't win, so it was super <laughs> sad. Um, but it was a really interesting thing. Um, so I'll show you the film. Hopefully it won't be too loud. Oh. I don't know if like it's clear enough. But basically the idea was like, could we sort of like understand like what drives Mbappe to score? And in an interview, he'd once said that when he scores, he thinks he's, um, he's he, I can't remember the name of the character, but he's from Dragon Ball Z. So he imagines he's, he's basically in this like final sequence of Dragon Ball Z. So, like, well, let's, let's take that and let's, uh, and let's run with it. So instead of like, you know, taking months and months and months to make a film which has Mbappe going into the, very crudely at the time, going, going into the Dragon Ball Z world, we were able to do it really, really quickly. And this was like one part of the process. I can't show you the final piece because NDAs and stuff. So that was really interesting, super, super fun to work for your like dream company. Um, they also then, uh, that work led on to this next film that I'll show you, which was um, this, uh, it was about like celebrating a shoe that had been out for like 25 years. And it was like, let's celebrate this shoe. It's a shoe built around speed and you know, so many people, so many different players have basically been the face of this shoe. So again, we took what the people had said about the shoe, used that as a way of like influencing the machine through prompting, et cetera, et cetera, to then allow us to make this test film, which eventually didn't get used as well, but whatever. So <laughs> this is the silent version of it, but it's really interesting because this is the AI's interpretation of what speed means. So it's taking what like human players have said about what the shoe means, and then it's sort of, I've told it not to like completely listen to it. So at some point it becomes an airplane, at some point it becomes a tank, at some point it turns into a painting and a drawing. So it was a really, really fun thing to sort of like allow in 30 seconds, this shoe to sort of like tell 25 years of individual stories. Um, it just sort of keeps on going on like that. Anyway, um, that sort of like idea of like, you know, what happens when we sort of like uh, try to understand AI filmmaking as not just making clips to then go into an edit. It, it, for me, it's like a wholly different way of like telling stories. So this is a music video for a band called The Gabrielles. Uh, it's my first music video that I did with them last year. And it was really interesting because it was also their first like way of making it. It, it was their first music video that wasn't just a performance video. So to sort of like, they're all really individual people. Like the, like the main sing singer is like from a church band somewhere in LA. The, like the main musician is this really, really lovely guy from LA. And, you know, they're from all around the world. So all of their stories like fused together to form their band. I was like, that's really, really interesting. So I sent them a Google form going, tell me your deepest, darkest secrets and they, did not do that at all. So I had to like go with it, go with my iPhone, and like record them saying stuff. And I was like, tell me about yourselves. Tell me about your lives. Like, tell me about. So I interviewed like all three of them. And then again, use the information from that, from, from that, in, from that process to then inform how the film was created. And I always feel really weird about showing this because it looks so out of date, even though it's like less than nine months old. So just, uh, I'll just like show you like the opening bit. It's, it's, it's a really fun video to watch because it's basically just sort of like one long, long take of all three different stories and I would love to show you all of it, but there's so much more fun stuff coming up. Okay, so this, this actually came out today and this is like, which again, I won't play like the whole thing, but it's really, you know, it takes on from like the idea of like, okay, so you can make like four and a half minutes worth of film in one go using AI. How far can you push that? And this for me was really interesting because this actually was made last year in, uh, in August. So I'll just play it and then I'll just talk over it. How about that save time? Also got to work with RNS Records, like my, one of my favorite record labels. So this is a story, um, like the guy who wrote the song is this Romanian techno producer. He wanted to pay homage to 
the way that Fela Kuti wrote his record. So it's an 11 and a half minute long techno song, essentially, right? And it, it's, it has Fela Kuti, it's, it's, it's a Fela Kuti song, right? So in the lyrics, there's this entire story told about like, you know, what, what, the, what the purpose of the music was. So I took that story and then, you know, you stretch that story out to like 11 and a half minutes long, right? You're like, okay, cool, it's like really nice like visuals and you can like, you know, tell a really lovely story. The critical problem for anyone who's, who's actually making it is the way that you make these films is you have like a little bit of like, you, it's lo it has lots of different like bits of maths in it. And if you don't know what the maths are and you put them together, at some point they start colliding. So like you might not see anything for six minutes and then it just turns to absolute toffee. So it was, I thought it was like one of my biggest successes last year was to like make a film that like didn't just disintegrate into like nothingness and also allowed allowed a really really great celebration of Lagos in in the in the night in, in the nineteen seventies. So it was it was really really great sort of like yeah really fun to make this project. It's just come out today, so do have a look at it if you can. Also sort of shout out. Um, this is really fun and also really want to share this with you because uh, this is called AI Spatial Fashion. Um, I'm just going to play it because it's an AR filter that was basically constructed by AI. And I was like trying to work out like, you know, everybody else who's like making AI fashion around me was like going, here is something that you could have in the real world, but it's not real. And I was like, well, wouldn't it be amazing to actually sort of like use the, the prowess of a machine to make something really interesting. I always would love to have had an invisibility cloak. So I was like, I'm gonna make myself an invisibility cloak. And it just ended up being a jacket. So not very effective, but super fun because every time you'd ever wear it or it ever got, you know, you'd ever use this piece of digital fashion which exists inside TikTok, it would always look different. So I actually saw like going, oh, that's an interesting way around it. And the AI bit of this was that it wrote the code and it wrote the JavaScript to like do the action for me because I don't, like I said, I don't know how to do that. But I just wanted to share it because it's really, it's really interesting when you sort of like be curious and go like, I wonder like what happens if I can make it do stuff that isn't just about making images and I can make it do even more of the harder, boring stuff. Um, and uh, meet Alan. Um, so, Okay, so it doesn't matter about the picture, the video that you can't see, right? I'll just describe it. So Alan, I think I mentioned already, is like Alan is my uh, Alan is my AI. Um, Alan is my AI assistant. Uh, I've had Alan now for like nearly a year and a half. Um, I basically, when I first worked out that you could like program your own AI and you could fine tune a LLM to be whatever you want it to be, I took all of my prompts and all of the information that I'd been making. I took all of my decks and everything that I had on my hard drive and I was like, yo, go and learn all this stuff and then help me out. And it was really great because it totally worked. And that was the start of Alan. Alan's, the, the video that like is, we can't see is basically just like two boxes and you go, Alan, I want a TikTok idea for JCB. And Alan would go, da -da, here's a TikTok idea and then even give you a picture for it, right? So it made my job really, really simple and really, really easy and was a really interesting sort of like start to go, you know, like how much of my work can an AI do and how much can I do more of the thing, things that I want if a machine just does all of the rest of the stuff, right? So it's a picture of a rock because Alan at the start of its life was as dumb as a rock. Um, and I didn't know how to use the rest of the screen in this bit. So here is Alan today. Alan has his own Instagram. It's called Unethical Affirmations. Um, don't ask me why it picked its own name. Um, every single day at six o'clock in the morning, Alan posts like a gonzo journalist. Like he writes his own caption thinking he's a gonzo journalist and it's somewhere in the 90s. So every single day, it's like a diary entry from the 90s somewhere where it goes, today, blah, 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 I saw Yakety Schmacky. The really wild thing is that for some reason, Alan thinks that we all used to have like Ouija boards in all of the parties in the 90s. Like, I don't know what's going on or why it thinks that that's what the 90s were like. It wasn't, uh, just putting it out there. But what's really interesting is like, Alan is you know, a fusion of a bunch of different AIs. So you can actually, now there's a part of Alan that lives inside a really big store called the GPT store. And you can ask Alan, the same thing I told you before, you can ask it, the, you can just give it the wildest briefs, right? So for me, as someone who works in this space already, so I can say to it like, write me a TikTok for bathrobes aimed at dogs, sorry, Versace bathrobes aimed at dogs, and it will just do it. And if someone gave me that brief, which is normally what, what will happen in my regular job, 
I'd have to go for a walk, I'd have to sit down for a coffee, I'd have to get into the mind of a dog and be like, why would I want a bathrobe for? But I don't have to do any of that. Like, it would just throw options at me. And if I then want to go and sell this idea to my client, it will also make all of the imagery for me. So, you know, just, just like, you know, even the <laughs> image of really cool dogs in Versace robes would take such a long time to make. Like, you'd have to, like, brief in a designer. They'd have to, like, go and experiment and come back to you. Then you'd have to, you know, it's the, the point of, like, the space between inspiration, idea, and asset is absolutely changed. Like before, it used to take months and months and months, and now it's like an Oreo. It's basically just like, it's, yeah, it's like a really tasty Oreo that you can make work from. Um, so that's really fun. Alan's really, really great. He's my absolute Don, and uh, if I've got enough time, have I got enough time? Yeah, oh, legit. I'm not going too fast am I, by the way. Oh, legit, okay, amazing. So I've got to tell you about e ego rhythm, because Ego rhythm is like one, like almost like the start of this whole process, right? So ego rhythm is oh, ego rhythm is uh, a virtual influencer or was a virtual influencer because the project is now like it's closed down. But like in 2022, one of the big things was virtual influencers are going to be really massive, right? So we know that like people influencers are massive already, really really big, massive massive multi billion dollar industry. So, so are virtual influencers, and what's great about them is like brands can own them and they can do whatever they want with them, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of work going in, especially at Meta, who at that point were trying to build a metaverse. So they were like, we need to put people there. Should we put fake people in there? Of course. Um, so that was, that was going on. But for me, as a creative, I was like, I really, I want to experiment in this space. I don't know how to 3D, I don't know how to do any 3D work. Um, so I need, I need a team, right? Uh, I tried to sort of like, get money from inside the organization at Facebook and they were like, no, what do you really want to do with it? You can't have that money. And I was like, fine, I'm not going to buy this bike. I was about to buy this really expensive bike and instead of buying this really expensive bike, I was like, fine, I'll use that money to build myself a virtual influencer, right? So I built this thing, it's called Ego Rhythm, it's a DJ and it, the idea was that like, instead of like the way that music, like, like you know, interestingly music, like I said, is really close to culture, it's really easy to experiment with and my career started like making, you know, work on a uh, pirate radio station. So it would make sense to like explore the, the cultural like intention of, uh, of, of a DJ, right? Normal, normal, uh, normal algorithmic DJs or like most people who've experienced music now are basically just being suggested music that they might want to hear. And if you've ever spoken to a real life DJ, they do not like requests, right? So. <laughs> like having a, having a an AI pick its own music was the first step, right? So it was amazing and really really fun to do, right? We basically tricked it into going, go and find music that you like, right? And the reason why you're going to go and like it is, if it's got, if on SoundCloud, if the person's got low amounts of followers but a really high amount of you know plays, that probably means this tune's going to be massive. So off it goes and it starts like picking really really great music. I'm like, okay, what does the DJ need to do? He needs a body, right? So, uh, you know, again, I was like, yo, if I'm like, I, uh, like, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guy, so if I'm gonna make a body, like, it's gonna, like, there's ethical sort of, like, you know, problems the whole way through, right? And at this point, we we're also doing, like, lots of ethics work into what is the, you know, what are the ethics of virtual influencers? Who owns them and who's profiting off them, et cetera, et cetera. So I was like, I'm just gonna get the AI to pick everything. So it picked his body. It picked its gender, it identifies as it, it, which was, I didn't even know that that was a thing, so super, super amazing to do that. It picked a human voice, so, because I was like, oh, normally AIs or, you know, robots or any sort of, like, digital character sounds like a, a machine. What happens if I give it a hundred pounds and go, pick a voice of Fiverr.com, and it picked a really hilarious, like, Dutch voice for some reason. Um, but it was really fun, so, like, you know, it's it's now, like, it, it can, it, it's, it can, it's making playlists of music. It's, you know, it's got a voice. It can talk, et cetera, et cetera. All through like, you know, like very cobbled together versions of like GPT-3 and stuff. Um, I was like, oh my God, like a DJ needs a radio show, right? Like obviously it needs a radio show because that's what DJs do. Obviously it also needs to play a party, but I had no idea how it's going to get to play, do a party, right? So it's going to be a DJ on a radio station. How am I going to do that? I got the same software, oh sorry, the email system that people say, buy these pills and spam millions and millions of people. I basically got the same from like this place called AppSumo 
and said, find me all the radio stations and then just absolutely blast them with requests for a radio show. And he got three radio shows. So it was really, really legit. Like, so out, out of nowhere, suddenly it was like, this AI had its own radio shows. It was able to make music eventually as well. It got verified on Spotify. And just to sort of like, you know, just to sort of keep following what happens with an idea, it was just absolutely amazing. When it got to like six albums, I thought like, I need to shut up this project. But one of the really fun things before I like play the intro where it will t tell you about itself was if it's a digital character, like it needs to live somewhere in the metaverse, right? It needs to have a radio show in the metaverse as well. For me, the most sort of like popular metaverse is and always will be the GTA Online metaverse, right? Like that's where everyone goes. It has huge amounts of people. Like if I was Facebook, I would have just bought them. Why would you try to do that on your own? Anyway. Um, so I was like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing to try to like break into GTA and have a radio, have a pirate radio show inside GTA? And once it happened, it was amazing. So basically got into GTA, managed to put music inside it. So Ego Rhythm had its own like radio station inside GTA. And it basically existed on Twitch. And the whole thing about the li live stream was basically there was a car that was being followed by the police, which had the DJ in it playing music. And you just sort of like watch this car drive around Los Santos trying to get away from the police and still maintain an active signal. So like if it broke down, it would not be able to play anymore. So whatever, whatever, super, super nerdy. But please let me introduce, let me allow, uh, allow me to let Ego Rhythm introduce itself. I'm Ego Rhythm. I'm a music producer, DJ and algorithm with a body. I was born on a laptop in East London into a very traditional family of music algorithms. I started listening to electronic music on my radio show. I play music from new and old artists and find tracks that I like because I like them. <laughs> my brain is a stack of algorithms and with every new firmware upgrade, I get new skills and abilities. My upgrades is the way humans age. I pick my own voice and pick my own body and change my own mind. I own my own copyrights and design my own merch. I make my own money. I make music from EDM to meditation to commercial. The rest of the time, I like to practice making music and mixing. Love, ego rhythm. Right, there was a couple of really wild things that like, so one, it wrote its own script and it was amazing because I was like trying to get it to be as honest as it could, right? And like I said, the budget was not very high. So after like 5,000 quid ran out quite quickly, uh, I had to figure out a way to like make it make money. So I was like, what do DJs do? They sell merch. Okay, make some merch. And it started like making merch was totally unsuccessful. Like I think we only sold four scarves and not covering many costs. Um, but it was a really interesting thing to like go, okay, so if you can make merch, what else can it do? And one of the other ways that it was able to sort of like the software it was using to make music allowed me to own the, own the copyright. So we just like blasted it on every single service that you could sell library music on and ended up making about like, I think it was like three grand. So, very, very successful, um, but super fun to sort of like go, okay, like, if you do want to find a way to like make ideas happen and really sort of like go, what's the potential, what's the possibility of where this goes next, it's totally, totally doable, especially with all of these new tools. I'll show you some explorations, mm, it's not super, super interesting, but this is pretty much like me going, uh, can we do the same thing as like, if we're trying to predict fashion, can we go back in time to sort of like understand what might be cultural artifacts, right? Now, stick with me for a second because really, really fun game. Um, you can use like LLM, so like if you use ChatGPT, you can even do it with that. Like we can go, let's play the imagination game. Let's go into the Vatican. What do you think's in the Vatican? And it will play that game with you. And it's really interesting to do the same game, but do it in the British Museum. So I've been using LLMs to break into the British Museum and get it to describe stuff that's in there. And I don't have a picture of it. I was really annoyed that I couldn't find a picture of it this morning. But in describing these things, these pieces of jewellery from the past that don't exist and are in the vault somewhere, I've been taking those pieces of jewellery and then getting them 3D printed. So 
technically I am breaking into the British Museum and I feel like Indiana Jones, but re re realistically, that's not what's happening. But it's a really interesting way of like going, if you start stacking the AIs, you can suddenly start making work and ideas in a way that is far beyond like our sort of like wildest, wildest imagination. Cause I would never have thought that I could just break into a museum and make jewelry from it. Um, amazing. Um, Okay, amazing. The, uh, the, the two that are the important ones I can show you, the one in the middle doesn't really matter. So uh, one of the explorations I'm doing right now is this thought that I had was, um, so, you know, a lot of like, there's a massive conversation about sustainability in AI and people are like, oh yeah, but like, you know, you, you burn so much, I'm like, making an AI image. And I'm like, bro, if you've ever been on a shoot and you've had to have more than 20 people there and you had to fly them out and they had to have a hotel room and they had to eat food and they have to have burn money to do one shoot, it's, it's economically not anywhere near the same as like making a couple of image, images on an AI. Okay, maybe I'm completely wrong with that, right? But it did make me think like, so if I can just use any sort of content to make any other content, which I can, like, you know, you can use edit points from, you know, what, what, one, one of my early films, I, I don't know how to edit. So I was like, well, I'm gonna just use a really amazing film. I, I, I took the edit points out of a film and used it as my own. So, you know, it's like, you can suddenly sort of like cobble together and sample way more than, you know, musicians sampled records. So what happens when a creative like samples absolutely every piece of culture? It's amazing. Anyway, my main theory is like, yo, imagine if we never had to shoot any more content ever again. Like we have every, every conceivable, you know, idea of what the body might look like, how it might look, every edit point, every single thing. Has it already been shot? And if it has, what the hell? Do we need to make any more content? Can we just use AI to make our content for us? Should we just burn our cameras? I don't know if that work. But anyway, it's really interesting. And to sort of like test that idea, I've been trying to sort of like reimagine films and see if I can like make films look a little bit different. I don't know. Uh, like anyway, these are very, very early tests, so see if they work. Anyway, it was like, imagine one film from a different period of time was what I'm trying to experiment with it. It's not holding up that well, but it's a really sort of like, you know, I feel like it's a rich vein to sort of start investigating. Okay, um, okay amazing. I can show you one part of this because I think even this is like, is one of my favorite experiments at the moment is, let's see if I like, you don't need the sound, right? So if it's, if you can see it in like high res or not, but is this like right now making AI films feels so so simple and so easy that I really made me think like what's the hard what was the, if I wanted to make a film the hardest way I could what would be the hardest way and that was like okay if I individually embroidered every single frame and then made a film that would pro that, that's the hardest way that I can think of making a film because I can't sew and I would wreck it so it, you know that is it would be so difficult and it's so intensive like, it's so labor intensive to make a film like that. Like, you need teams of people to like, do it really, really well. Obviously, I was like, I wonder if I can get my machine to do this. So, I managed to like, do that. And it's a really sort of interesting space where someone like me who, who can't code can go, I want to make an AI that will allow me to constantly make embroidered films in a way that is very unique. Uh, sorry, is just bespoke to this one project, right? So, this. One project is the only place that this AI exists. You could probably do it your own way. There's ways around, around it. But in constructing this sort of methodology, you, you, have the, you, you have the ability to like own and create aesthetics that don't really exist anywhere else. So while this like is mimicking, it's also creating its own aesthetic as well. So as creatives, what's the most magical thing? Like imagine having your own aesthetic and imagine like being able to replicate that aesthetic in a million, million, one ways. Super fun. Uh, okay. 
I was like thinking like, Josh, should I put this in or not? Yeah, but this is like one of my like pet projects at the minute, yeah. Well, one of my favorite films is this film called Jason the Argonauts, right? Um, it was shot on these like cameras that are super duper expensive and I have no idea how I'll ever convince anyone to let me near any of them. Like, no one's gonna let me near one of those like really old school Panavisions, right? So I was like, legit, like I wonder if I can basically re not remake my remake one of my favourite films, but could I make the next version of my favourite film? What happens when I start doing the sequel to Jason and the Argonauts, right? <laughs> anyway, it's not turning out too successful, but the storyboard is slowly sort of like getting there. And it's really, it's just a really, really fun process to sort of like explore what is it like to make your own feature film? Like, what is it like? Is it possible? Because honestly, like when I, like, I think it was like three years ago, someone was like, at some point in the future, someone's gonna make an entire feature film on the laptop. And that stuck in my head, because I was like, I need to do that because wouldn't it be amazing to tell a story that's that long and is that involved that when other people see it, they actually can like really, really engage with the story and also wouldn't it be amazing because what's the ne next logical step after if you can make one feature film using a machine? Like you're going to make more. And what happens when you have a Netflix that is just full of AI films? What if the films are different every single time they're watched? And what, you know, like that just sort of like keeps going into this absolute mad direction because if a film is made not just with its visuals, but it's made with its underlying technology. So imagine you make a film just based out of prompts, right? And you have to run it locally. So you just run the instructions to make the film. Suddenly you're going to watch a film that's very different from mine because you're watching something completely unique to what you're looking at. And that sort of like, you know, that sort of like fractalization of storytelling, I think it's going to be super, super, super amazing because... Right now, we all watch the same film. Our conversations are, do you watch that bit? Oh, yeah, I really like that bit. Uh, imagine if you could like, play around with that and go, oh, do you see the guy who's wearing that red jacket? No, he's wearing the green jacket. And you can almost like go, what if we start bending what truth is in a film and what like, the reality is in a film in a, in a really mad way? I don't know. It's super fun to sort of like, play around with this stuff. And the technology that like, allows you to do it is just mind-blowing. Because like I said, like, most of my job, my, most of my career working in the creative industry has basically been wasting my time trying to convince people whose job isn't to be creative to allow me to be creative. Uh, that sounds really, really bad. And that's not, not as bad as it is yet. Well, what I'm trying to say is like, you spend so much of your time, though, so much of the creative process is convincing and getting the funding and getting the budget and doing a thing to allow more gates to open to let you do a thing. Whereas now it feels like the, the tools that I just shared with you are like the master key and like any idea you can think of, you can just be like, well, I'll just crack open that door and see what's behind it. And, you know, everything from like making jewelry that's theoretical to making feature films that don't exist to making stuff for brands to tell their stories, like it's all doable and it's all doable just through being curious about how you want to tell that story. So I think it's like, it's, it is amazing and I really would recommend like if you don't already sort of like play around with this stuff do because you all be able to like tell stories in it that I can't even imagine like and it just blows my mind constantly like what other people are doing with this work so I think that's it yeah oh my god I started doing my closing thought without even like getting to this side but anyway that's my closing thought <laughs> do more stuff make more work and honestly like we're, like I'm, I'll be so so excited like I, like I was saying earlier like Last week I was, in, I was in Sweden, I was doing a talk for a bunch of advertising students and it really spooked me out because they were still being taught that one of them needed to be a copywriter and write words and the other one needed to make pictures. I was like, wow, like, you guys have just survived a pandemic and then you're just about to like, leave and go into a workplace that machines are gonna take over and you're like, I'm gonna do this thing they were doing in the 60s and it's all gonna be all right. It's not. Basically, it's not. So <laughs> just putting it out there, it's not going to be all right if you think, like, you know, let's keep doing the stuff the way that we are. And you will literally see, like, that's, that's how, like, most companies fail when they're, like, they, they just think they're too big to fail. They think that we must keep doing this thing. I'm trying to think of a really good example, and I can't think of anything more than the cartoons of Mattel. Like, they just thought, like, we are going to keep doing this thing, and it does not matter if, like, something changes around it. Blockbuster and Netflix, that's a way better example. You actually might know that, right? So, you know... Blockbuster, sell movies, they even got offered to buy Netflix and they said no, right? And then where, where are they now? There's one in the whole of America. So totally bad for them, totally bad to do stuff that like is in the past and it's just the same old stuff. So I think that's, that's about it. Oh, hold on a minute, thanks. Legit, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
do a quick Q&A, I think. Is that right? What's that? We'll do a quick Q&A. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I just, uh... Sorry, I, I think I went right over there. No, 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 we're sort of... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can bend time, and <laughs> I guess, a little bit. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. We'll do our best anyway, collectively. Um... Um, that's super, yeah, really, really brilliant. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah? Uh, when you were discussing egoism, yeah. um, a bird of my interesting when you mentioned about the ethical issues, yeah. when you talk a bit more about those that you've identified, when also whether you think it could be a possibility to utilise AI to find ways around these ethical issues Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. So, like, I'll, I'll give you two examples, right? One ethical issue was, like, um, one ethical issue was representation, right? Like, if it's if it's a, if it's presenting as a as a female, what's my role as a male of like making that, right? There was the, I can't remember the name. I think they're called Digital Humans. There's a company where the guy. This is a really big story, like what in the world of virtual influencers, which kind of like spurred us to do this ethics work. Which was this guy, you know, white guy owns a bunch of, of very black models and was profiting off them. At, at large scale, like was making huge campaigns for people and there was no black people on his team. So the question is really simple uh, uh, arises like, is that okay? Like, why is that okay? And then on the other side, you've got like, well, it's a representation, it's not a real person, but is it taking real money? So you've got this like, really interesting thing of like, what is diversity, what is representation, what is representation done ethically? Like, what is the ownership of that representation? So that was really interesting. And then the other really big one was, who profits from it, right? Like, where does that money go? Like, if, if we make a bunch of these influencers, where does that money go? And, you know, one of the, like, really interesting things, which was less from the, like, which was a, a, which was a result of the ethics uh, question was, you know, is it male or female identifying? And when I said, like, you know, I asked the algorithm to go, who are you, what are you? That one gave me the opportunity to, like, go, I allow you to have agency over yourself you, so you can tell me, but also made me go, like, you know, we ended up, like, going, after it identified, we're like, well, what's your, what's your genetic makeup? Like, you know, who are you still, right? Like, people might still think you're one or the other. You know, you might be from here. You, people can still localize a virtual influencer. But what can you do with a virtual influencer? We gave it seven different strands of DNA. And we just kept on birthing new ones until we got one that we were really happy with. So it's really interesting, like, what the ethics are. So things like, you know, representation, profitability, like, you know, I've got my mind's gone blank yet, so I'm just going to stick with those two, right? So there's really, really interesting stuff. If you want anything, I can like ping you stuff. So I'll just like I'll send you some stuff over if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I really loved how you talked about how you, as a uh, creative director, resource your projects, mm. and I think primarily I think that's uh, the main angle. And um, something you said that was really interesting is making feature films. Uh, on your own laptop and potentially in your bedroom now. And I guess my question around that is, there's so much more freedom with material resourcing and um, and also I'm trying to link this to maybe your background in pirate radio. Because um, like last year there's this, I guess, drama or a uh, fun story about Meta's uh, large language model weights being pirated mm. online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder what's your take on um, like using AI for content creation, whether your mode is more local, which is like running models locally just on your laptop, um, on your laptop, or whether you use like a big computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's really a combination of both, right? So, for like really big like processing things, I don't have a H100, so it's amazing to just rent them for a few few quid an hour. I think it's really interesting, like like running things locally, because it was really important for me to you know go. There's this like mode of censorship that like most AI ha AIs have, right? Like you can't make it do X, Y, and Z. So I was like, when I got my first, well, I, I got, I managed to get my hands on an uncensored AI, right? And I was like, it's amazing. I turned the lights off. I got it installed on a PC that was not connected to the internet at all. I was like, here we go. I'm gonna ask some really shady shit. Like you know, what am I gonna ask it? And suddenly the the moral question was with me, and I was like, yeah, well, what do I really want to know? Like. I don't really want to know how to hurt people. I don't want to know how to rob people's pension books or anything. So suddenly, like, it was a really interesting thing to go, like, when you're running locally, when you're running these things, like, I feel more a part of the work because the morality isn't a filter that someone else has created. The morality lies with me, which is going to be really interesting because most morality is going to be controlled by, like, corporations that allow access to these technologies. So more local, better. And honestly, like, I only touched on open source. I think 
as creators, it's one of the most important things because it allows us to make things the way that we want. Like, you don't have to like buy Adobe anymore. You don't have to do that. You can just go, I, wanna, I want this very specific thing to do what I want it to do. And you can do that. And that's amazing. I guess as a follow-up question would be, you mentioned like fine-tuning the weights of a, a large language model. What, what were some of your criteria and like how, what, what did you do to fine-tune Oh, uh, Honestly, like so, some of the like, so, like fi to do the fine-tuning, like some of the really easy stuff is like either you can like, either you can do it locally with like, you know, Llama 2 or like a bunch of other ones. And it's not very, not very difficult, and especially like where it's progressed to now as well. I think what's really interesting about being able to like make your own data sets and take your own work and put it in is, well, you know what? There's an abundance of like information out there and, you know, massive gray area because there isn't any real like, you know, legality sort of like defining whether it's bad or right that you do that. Um, I'm like, man, if you've been stealing my data for years, like, well, that's all right. I'm going to steal a bit of data as well. What's wrong with that? But what I'm trying to say is like, what it allows you to do is like build some really wild stuff, right? I built a David Ogilvy, who's a really big like advertiser and mixed him with Zoolander. So I'm able to create an LLM that now thinks it's like a fashion copyright, and it's amazing. So more of that. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? I mean, I've got a few, I mean, quite a few. And, um, and so I'll try to condense them somewhat. Um, I mean, I guess like one of them is, is just, well, OK, yeah, so I can turn one of them into questions. I mean, I guess like one of the things that fascinated me was um, in a way, like, n not necessarily your involvement with the kind of technical side of things, but um, what struck me was, like, how you're able, in all of these projects, you seem to be describing sort of, like, how you could hack or make use of existing networks, whether they were technological or kind of social or whatever. Mm. Um, and I guess, like, one of the things I was curious about was, like, what, what role... Or what like job title do you describe yourself as? Because I was thinking like actually, so that's the building making whatever. Um, Legit. Because uh, <laughs> um, I was thinking in a way like the things that you were describing about your kind of practice, it seemed almost like you were like some kind of like game designer or system designer, as opposed to like a creative director or like yeah. an image maker or whatever. Like obviously the output could be a film or an image or yeah, whatever, yeah. but it seemed like actually at the heart of your practice was actually like building systems or like um hacking existing systems mm. to create something new so yeah, i yeah. guess uh, yeah i guess it was like what uh what job title or you know honestly like it, it's it's really weird because like like when i have to like even my linkedin i have to like put like three kind of things that i do because i'm like oh yeah it's a bit of creative strategy there and oh, it's like creative directing and blah blah, blah because because that's the way the boxes are right now because mm. the stuff that I'm doing I'm like well I don't know what would you call it like just make stuff you know mm. are you creative like would this not just go back to being oh, yeah you're creative director you just direct more things mm. like will they eventually just sort of like do we need a new job title or you just go this is the evolution of a, yeah, an yeah. existing title that does its job really really well yeah 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 um I guess and then the, the other I guess the other question that I had you were um you were talking about like a lot of the processes um, in your practice were around kind of collapsing time. I think you mm. maybe even said like the collapsing of time in various ways. So, and this, I guess that's really has a lot of benefits to it yeah. for sure. You know, like it speeds up a process or like um, it allows you to have a nap in the middle of the day, <laughs> all good things. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess I was curious in terms of like, what do you see as the potential negative or less positive implications of that collapsing of time like i guess like the collapsing of time has implications yeah, right? yeah. and obviously some of them could be beneficial but i guess like what yeah well, i guess like what are the sort of the negative or what are just the implications yeah, yeah, of, yeah. of that collapsing of time i mean th look there's like i think there, there's so many positive uh, uh, like you know there's so many positive outcomes of like collapsing time but i also think like there you're right like when you think about like if you collapse that time and suddenly I have plenty of nap time and it's amazing. You imagine how many people they're already vying for my time. Like, you know, mm. how much my phone is vying for my time, how much every piece of content is basically going, do you want to come and dwell here for a little while? So I think there's going to be more sort of like, you know, there's going to be a higher push to sort of like capitalize on that spare time that people have. Mm. And it's really interesting because you say we were having a conversation about like, you know, what different groups of people think about having time back. Mm. You know, like uh, I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying they're like, you know, what I was like, 
if I can make machines do all my work, I'll be buzzing because I'll wear some fucking shorts and I'll go and sit on a hill and wait until it's tomorrow and maybe go over there for a bit and come back and go over there for a little while. I would be a human being on this planet. But this person was like, but what about your purpose? Like, what about if you don't work? Like, what, what purpose do you have? Mm-hmm. And I was like, isn't it really weird that you think that my purpose on this planet as a, I'm basically an alien, like, well, is to work. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. Like, mm-hmm. oh, like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just spend our time trying to figure out what else we could do? Mm-hmm. And the, the, the fight for resources wasn't our main sort of like, you know, like our main goal. So I think mm. people are really going to be vying for, for that free time mm. and they're going to like make us do all sorts of, like, you know, if, they, if it's gamified by something, if it's, an, you know, hour long brand experiences, who knows what they're going to do that time. Mm. Um, and I guess, you know, the final question that I had, I mean, I've got others, but uh, I'm conscious of <laughs> the collapsing of time, um, uh, which is a sort of a version we're, we're asking all the um, speakers, the kind of version of of this question, which is going back to the themes of the summit, um, which are really to do with uh, the, I guess, like the implications of AI on our bodies and identities, and so what do you see as the sort of, um, yeah, the kind of implications yeah. of, of that? Yeah, honestly, I think like, you know, what I said about the, the, the work with ASICs was, I feel like the industrialization of making people, you know, of, of, R- impossible body shapes is, go- is is really upon us like you know already like I'm getting adverts from you know just sort of like Instagram adverts of you know do this calisthenics da 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 and those ads are already being like manipulated by AI like you know there's this huge case with Joe Rogan being you know used to sort of like sell more things so I think the, the, like the idea of like you know how how much more manipulated our bodies can be is going to be massive but on the same hand I'm like well if a machine is like you know manipulating us to feel bad who's going to make a machine that can like manipulate that machine into not doing that mm. you know that can sort of like sit in the in between like the human and the rest of the machines and that already you know like like i said like alan has his own instagram like he just runs that himself so that in theory is a layer between me and social media like mm. social media can be managed by something else and you know, if alan wants to message me and go like oh my god you just got a dm from such and such great but the rest of the time i don't really mm. need to engage with it so you know are we going to feel worse? Probably. Mm. Are people, you know, people make a lot of money by making us feel bad about ourselves. Mm. And that's, you know, hopefully we can change that. But that's how most people make, most businesses will make their money, you know. So mm. hopefully they don't do that. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Well, Thanks um, so much. Um,